Hey guys, um, I'm back with another video log, kind of a rehash of an old log. Uh, if you go back to video log number three, years ago, uh, where I'm outside and there's a lot of planes flying overhead, <laughs> uh, I discussed the topic of over the topic of overtraining. Uh, there's recently kind of been a little bit of resurgence of debate on this, and uh, I kind of wanted to, I guess the the typical thing is there's people who say you can't overtrain, you can only under uh, under eat, and then other people who say you know don't train any more than one hour a day because um, that's going to kill your gains. Uh, and uh, I guess I want to look to be a, a, maybe the voice of reason and evidence in this, and and not emotion um, because uh, for whatever reason people get really emotional when they're talking about this kind of stuff. So. First off, when we look at overtraining, does overtraining exist? It depends on how you define overtraining. If you define overtraining as training to the point where your performance starts to decrease um, and you have different disruptions in uh, objective measures of performance and output, um, yes, that exists, that absolutely exists. In fact, uh, Olympic athletes routinely use overreaching or, or which is I guess a short-term overtraining and, and power lifters weightlifters do as well um, to induce a super compensation so the idea is you actually purposefully overtrain and then you run a taper and that actually causes kind of a rubber ba rubber band effect where you like you pull a rubber band and you let it go not only does it snap back to its original position it goes farther okay so we call that like peaking for, for an event um, so that's actually an example of, yes, overtraining exists, um, but if you're using it as kind of a tool, uh, it can be a useful tool in your tool belt. Now, can you push that to the point where um, it becomes a negative in terms of chronically decreasing performance? Um, sure. And in fact, what usually happens, and, and this is kind of an anecdote, but what usually happens people who keep pushing themselves past that initial overreaching point, uh, they just get injured. Okay. Their volume's too high for their training status and they can't accommodate it and they just get injured, okay? Not always, but uh, would you continue to see performance decrements? It's hard to say. Um, if you kept pushing through that, you didn't get injured. Um, my, my guess is initially you would and then eventually probably the body would adapt to that. Um, skeletal muscle is extraordinarily adaptive. Um, it will tend to take whatever you can throw at it. For example, the, the first time you ever did legs, you were probably sore for like, I don't know, over a week, right? And then if you've ever gone from working them out once a week to twice a week, you know that you were really sore when that started. And then by the time after four or five weeks of that, you stop getting as sore. And then if you've gone to three times a week, you probably hardly get sore at all from training legs. So you, you, your body gets adapted to what you do, okay? Now, as far as overtraining defined as, can you overtrain to the point where you actually break down muscle tissue, do not rebuild it, and you see appreciable loss of muscle mass? There is no evidence I'm aware of or have ever seen to suggest that actually exists. Now, could you possibly train so hard um, or so much that you, you actually um, don't make as good of gains as you could have made? I don't know. Um, again, there's no data on that. My my kind of thought would be that you probably don't impair gains probably as much as just you're doing more than you really need to do and you're setting your volume threshold too high and you're risking uh, injury when you don't need to be. Um, I, I had a good debate with um, Eric Helms um, and Mike Israetel and Greg Knuckles about maximum recoverable volume versus minimum effective dose of training. Uh, it's on Jeff Nippard's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I think it's Ice Cream for PRs. I would suggest checking that out. I'll, if I can find it, I'll link it here. Um, I would suggest checking out that debate so we, you can talk. You'll see that we kind of agree on most things. So um, volume is the major driver for hypertrophy and strength. I mean, the, 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 I guess strength, you can argue. My good friend, Dr. Lindeke, would argue that. And for, for hypertrophy, it seems to be relatively clear based on meta-analyses that have been done that volume is the major factor. Now, 
That does not mean that more volume is better. It depends on you as an individual and your training status. You need to progress volume appropriately. Uh, there was a study, Eric Helms likes to refer to a study a while back where they, they looked at kind of a, a low frequency and volume training, a moderate frequency and volume training, and a high frequency and volume training. And they found that the moderate was best in this particular group of people, okay? My guess is if you progress them on that program, in a few years, the higher volume program would be better, okay? In this particular circumstance, with their training status, my guess is they were able to achieve the threshold they needed for adaptation and hypertrophy without going so far that they were chronically overreaching and negatively and having negative impacts on their performance, okay? Now, all three groups gained muscle. Okay, all right, all three groups improved, but it was just the middle one tended to do best. Okay, so that's important to keep in mind. You're not there again, there is no research I'm aware of to show that if you train so much, you will actually become catabolic. That, to my knowledge, that research does not exist. Okay, I think one of the other things to realize is that high volume today for you, for your training status, may be low volume three years from now. Okay. As you adapt, as you get better, as you recover better, as you train that ability to recover, because you do train the ability to recover, um, what you used to be able, to, what used to be very challenging for you, is no longer going to become, become challenging. It's just like if you ever tried to run a mile and you never run a mile before, and you go out and you try to do it, it's going to feel like it's killing you. And then after, I don't know, a couple months of doing that, it becomes relatively easy. Okay, so you can train that recovery. You can train that adaptation. You can train to be better at performance. Um, I think the other thing to keep in mind is appropriate progression of volume. Um, sure, volume is important. And you could go out and you could do 10 sets of 10 in volume training, right? And yes, you'd make gains if you didn't get injured, okay? When you are at a lower level of training status, your skill level is lower. And if you take up more volume, every time you get under the bar, every time you grab the bar, there's a possibility you can get injured. We don't like to acknowledge this fact, but this fact, in fact exists. Um, so if you are unskilled or lesser skilled, and you are repeatedly grabbing that bar and doing that exercise in a low skill level, at a high volume level, you are increasing the poss possibility that you can get injured. Okay. So I always tell people, I, I like to suggest progressing on the minimum amount of volume that's in the, an effective dose. That's what Eric Helms and I say. Uh, Mike Israel, Dr. Israel would say that um, you, know, you should use the maximum recoverable volume. I think we're arguing semantics and that those two things are very, very close together. Um, I just tend to use things like minimum effective dose because knowing the population I know with, with weightlifters um, and bodybuilders, they tend to think more is better, more is not better, better is better. Okay. So I hope this has given you guys some insights. Oh, one other thing, and I talked about this in my other video, when people talk about, oh, don't go over an hour training because cortisol goes up. Uh, cortisol, short-term rises and falls in hormones mean absolutely nothing in terms of long-term hypertrophy. I'll say that again. Short-term acute rises and falls in hormones, that includes testosterone, IGF-1, uh, growth hormone, insulin, uh, cortisol, mean nothing for a long-term hypertrophy, okay? If you have chronically elevated levels of testosterone uh, above normal, yes, you will see greater hypertrophy. If you have chronically elevated levels of cortisol, you will see less hypertrophy, okay? But the short 30 to 60 minute rise that you're seeing from training is not driving hypertrophy. Training is driving those increases or decreases in hormones as substrate utilization. Growth hormone goes up during training not because it's signaling you to grow. By the way, growth hormone is not anabolic. Check out my article on biolane.com, growth hormone, great expectations. Growth hormone, not anabolic, not. Um, anabolic to uh, connective tissue, not anabolic to skeletal muscle. So that short-term rise in growth hormone is not there to induce hypertrophy. It is there to mobilize fatty acids, growth hormone is lipolytic and mobilizes fatty acids. So you're mobilizing fatty acids for fuel. Um, testosterone, cortisol, all those things are involved in substrate utilization. Cortisol uh, increases blood glucose. It increases glucose utilization or glucose liberation from cells. Okay? Those are 
substrate utilization driven. They are not driving anabolism and catabolism. Okay. Um, and, and in fact, uh, a, a, a study by Stu Phillips he showed that um, when you associate when you took associations between hormones, um, the hormone that was associated with hypertrophy and strength more than insulin, more than IGF one, more than testosterone, more than growth hormone, was cortisol. Okay. Now cortisol is an, cortisol is not anabolic; it's catabolic. But the reason you're seeing that is because the workouts that are the most stressful, that are the most likely to induce adaptation and hypertrophy, are also going to produce the greatest rise in cortisol. So again, short-term rises and falls in cortisol are not catabolic. Um, so the whole keep your workouts under an hour thing it, it, is nonsense. Okay. The other thing to consider is those studies were done in endurance athletes where they are they're, when they're running they're, or biking or whatever they're doing, it's a, it's a consistent thing. When you're weight training, typically you're resting for longer than you're actually training in between sets. Okay? Not everybody, but most people. So it's not, it's not the same thing. Okay? Definitely not the same thing. So some people, you may be able to progress on one hour a day. But, and if you can, by all means, do that. Okay? But that will only take you so far. You're going to have to get to a point where you're going to have to go uh, to a greater volume dose or a greater frequency dose or both. Okay, and then, so I would recommend checking out some of my other videos where I talk about volume and I talk about periodization, and you can get a better idea of, of those things. So I hope this video has been helpful. Uh, if you guys want more great information like this, check out my site, biolane.com. Uh, we have a member's site where we have really high level expert interviews and articles. Um, I also do a, a monthly webinar for my members, um, so you can learn more great stuff like this. Check out my, my customized flexible dieting service for $10 a month avatar nutrition uh, based on your uh, individual data. It will generate custom macros for you and then we'll adjust those macros each week based on your goals and how you progress. And uh, also my supplement line, Carbon Supplements, available at bodybuilding.com exclusively uh, for science-based, effectively those products. Um, this is what I recommend because it's what I use. All right, guys. I hope you've enjoyed the video and I'll catch you next time.